Amen. I'll tell you why that's so important. Often, and I would say almost every single time our faith falters, we struggle in the Christian life in some way. It's because our view of God is not big enough. I, I never cease to be amazed at people who don't want God to be sovereign. They still want to have some aspect of control in some way over salvation. They want to be able to earn part of it. They want to be able to say, I deserve it. I've done this to deserve it. When in truth, there really is no mature Christian who's ever, ever come to the conclusion that anything I have in regard to my salvation, any blessing I have, it all comes from God. It does come from God, every single aspect of it. And he is great for sure. We're back in First Peter this morning in chapter 1. We're going to look at, begin to look at four more verses today. And I've entitled this uh, sermon, which will take a couple of weeks, because the passage is just so full of truth, and I don't want to skip over anything that I have, that don't have to. I've entitled this Rejoicing in Trials. Now, those two words I have chosen are the words that Peter uses. The reason I have chosen them, and I like to think the reason the Holy Spirit guided Peter into using them, is because they are so idiomatic to our mind, to our understanding. They don't make sense. How can two words like this go together in the same uh, statement? Uh, I just also am amazed and give God and Christ credit for allowing every aspect of our experience this morning to mesh together into one complete truth. And if you were in Sunday school talking about the faith of those ten men who came back and gave uh, a negative report, that's sort of where we are today in our state of Christianity. Everything is negative. Everything is going wrong. What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to pose a question to you before I get to really giving you my answer. What if God wants things to be bad? What if God doesn't want to call America back to himself? What if that's his will? That our government goes down this path leading toward judgment. What if that's God's will? Can that be God's will? Yes. What if it is? <laughs> Interesting. And where is your faith when you consider those things? I, I honestly believe that much of what we're seeing today is God's judgment on us. We are getting what we deserve as a nation. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. I don't like it any more than you do, but all the rallies and all the the things in the world are not going to change it. And talking about, you know, standing up for our faith. Okay, so you win at the ballot box. Let's see where that gets you. Okay, you're going to change the heart of sinful men? No. The only thing that will change anything is God's power sweeping through our land in revival, changing the hearts of men and women, bringing them to Christ. They've got to have different hearts they're not going to follow him. That's just the basic scriptural truth. Now, with that in mind, let's look at these verses here. These readers of Simon Peter were, again, in probably around the area of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, ancient, uh, uh, ancient Asia Minor in those days. They were most likely Christians of a Jewish background in some way, probably of the diaspora. And so here they were scattered as he speaks to them in the first couple of verses. They were persecuted. They had no place in society. They had no influence. They were feeling helpless. And so Simon Peter writes to them. We don't know the extent of their persecution, but we know they were being persecuted. And he builds on what he has just told them about the inheritance toward which they are marching. And he ends that statement in verse number 5 saying, You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. God is keeping you in your salvation until uh, that is revealed in the last time. That will be a tremendously grand validation, will it not? I'm looking forward to that when all the world will know we were right. <laughs> now, that's not a carnal statement, but in whatever position we are in, it will be glorified in our mind, and we will understand that it's most importantly a validation of all that God has ever said when that is revealed in the last time. But then he continues and says this. Wherein, that is in that salvation, you greatly rejoice... 
Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold or various temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith at that moment, even the salvation of your souls. So many, many elements of truth in that one passage. I'm not sure any of us ever come to the place where we fully accept, I mean really accept, that bad things are going to happen to good people. That Christian people who do their best to walk according to God's principles of righteousness, who have trusted in him, not the troublemakers of society, not the dregs of society, not the ones that pull everyone else down, but those of us who believe we are right because we've trusted in Jesus Christ and we know we are because our faith and agenda is in him. I'm still sure that we've never really come to terms with the fact that things don't always go our way. As a matter of fact, most often, as we are finding out, bad things do happen. Hurtful people cross our path. They say things they should not say. They cut us to the quick with their words and their opinions. And, and trying situations always seem to be just around the corner. The stretches of life that do not contain such trials are far too short and they are far and few in between. For most of us, we still expect life to go on unfettered by difficulty. And when difficulty does come, it's always an unwelcome intruder. In truth, however, life is more like a tapestry woven with both good and bad. It's inseparable. You're not going to find anyone who has lived a life without some sort of trouble. Now, there may be a silken thread of joy that runs unfettered for quite some time. We may experience a long period of peace, prosperity in our life. But sooner or later, there will show up a dark thread of grief or despair and of heartache. And we know that it's coming. We should be ready for it to come. But when it comes, if you're like me, all too often we're not ready when it does appear. The thing that makes us different, however, from the world. The world, anybody in the world knows that good things happen, bad things happen. Everybody, you know, they write songs about it. They attribute it to faith. They talk about things like karma, yin and yang, good and bad, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Well, none of those things are found in the Bible. What we know from the Bible is, is that Christians are redeemed people who are living in the midst of a broken, fallen world. We are affected on every hand by this broken, fallen world. We are also affected inwardly by that part of us which is the residue or the residual aspect of our old, broken, fallen person. Now, I point you to that point at the end of verse number 9, where Peter encourages them at the end of this passage and says that though you see him not, you're looking forward to that day, you love him, rejoicing the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, he presents that as a future thing. We stand up all the time and give testimony. I thank God for saving my soul. And we could not be more wrong than that. God didn't save. I'm getting persnickety here, and I'm combing with a very fine comb, but I think there's a biblical point here. That aspect of you and me, that soulishness, my mind, my agendas, my motives, my emotions, that aspect that resides in me which is not holy and right and always on par with what God would have me do, God has it. He's not finished with that. That's still in a work in progress. It's called sanctification. Is there an aspect of every Christian that is completely saved and, and set apart and sealed for eternity? Yes. Part of that will, will never change. We are different, but thus we have 
that tension. I'm looking forward to the day when my soul is completely saved. My mind, my thought process, my emotions, my agenda, my, my uh, motives, all of that is, is saved. But it's not happened yet. And part of the way God is working me toward the completion of that, to when I'm ultimately like him in my being, both body and soul, is that aspect and that process of sanctification. And so part of sanctification necessarily includes trials. They've got to come. There's no way that you and I will ever become like him and serve his purpose in our life, accomplish his purpose in our life, honor him to the greatest of our ability unless we go through trials. And for the Christian, it's different than the worldling. The worldling is that the world's, um, whatever the world wants to happen in the, in the worldling's life. The lost person is like a ship on that wave being tossed to and fro. No control over anything. But the Christian knows why trials come. We know why God allows bad things to happen. We know why he allows people to hurt us. We know why he allows unjust criticism. We know why he allows circumstances, financial failure. We know why he allows that. And Peter is telling us that here. But such is the tapestry of life as we know it. And that was exactly the kind of life that the readers of Peter's letter had. And he expresses that in these verses. He says, I know what you're going through, but here's how you have to look at it. There's a poem written by an unknown author. And I thought of many of you who spent your careers in textiles back before they left the way they did. But a lot of you know something about weaving. And so I found this, this poem. I think it's very, very apropos to read it right here. And so here's what this unknown author has written. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors he works steadily. Oft times he weaves sorrow, and I, in foolish pride, forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hands as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. Another author named William Blake put it this way. Joy and woe are woven fine. They're inextricable. You can't separate one from the other. Well, the verses before us lend balance to what Peter has just said. He has just left them on a high note. You need to take courage as you're passing through this world because the ultimate inheritance will be glory. The ultimate inheritance will be heaven where there is no sickness, pain, or sorrow. You have that to look forward to. Rejoice even though, he says, and then... He begins this in verse 6. Rejoice at that inheritance, even though getting there will call for our endurance of manifold or various trials. Now, as we go through this passage, I'm going to look at it this way. First of all, today we're going to look at the types of trials the Bible presents. There are several types. Sometimes we refer to trials in different ways. Sometimes I have heard Christians talk about trials that I thought were trials, and other times I have heard them talk about trials that I really didn't think so much. If you have brought, and Peter's going to tell us this, if you bring trials on your own life by sinning, that's not a trial. That's just our mess up. <laughs> and we still need to learn from that. We create our own trials, unfortunately, at least I have a lot through life. But then there are those things that are out of our hands. Then we'll talk about the testing of trials beginning next week. What is it that God is doing? Boy, some very beautiful language here. And finally, we will talk about the temptation of trials. What is it that every man or woman is tempted to do 
when God allows trials in their life. But for now, what are the types of trials? I thought this would be helpful to look at these places in the Bible. Not everything's a trial that we think is, but then a lot of things are trials maybe we don't consider. And I think every one of these fits in the context of what Peter is saying. First of all, there are trials of wondering. How, what a beautiful coincidence. Isn't it just a coincidence when you come from one building and you, you have just finished talking about illustration of what the pastor is about to preach on? Isn't that just amazing? And how do I know that? Because the Bible actually says, hey, that's an illustration of this kind of trial. There are trials of wondering, trials where we don't get what we want, trials of frustration, trials of having to wait and while we're waiting, it's not so pleasant. In Hebrews chapter 3, which of course is a letter, or a, a, a work at least, written about uh, the Jewish situation, the Jewish context, how that compares to Christianity, and how have we, what we have in Christ is so much better. Here's what the author, whom I believe Paul to say, uh, to have been. He says, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today if you'll hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. What is that? In the day of temptation in the wilderness. <laughs> well, there were several points of temptation in the wilderness. By the way, most of the time when you see the word temptation and trial, you can use them synonymously. They're the same word in the original language most of the time. In this case, that is true. We could translate this. At the last part of that passage, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Boy, if we were to list all the trials they went through, we could spend the rest of the day just talking about this. I mean, they, they're, they're just out of the gate, and they don't have anything to eat, at least not what they want. And so God provides them supernaturally with this bread, which contains everything in it that they need. It tastes pretty good, and all you, all you have to do is walk out your door and gather it every single day. There it was. But that wasn't good enough. You know, we all know that what God provides is never good enough for our human passion and flesh, or they complain. God, we want meat. They failed in that point. That was a trial, wasn't it? Yeah. They, before that, they stood before the Red Sea. Moses stands there. The, the sea is before them. Pharaoh's behind them. What do they do? A trial where they're being squeezed. <laughs> I mean, the evil is close on their trail, what are they to do? The only thing to do is trust God or die. And God delivers them. Parts the water, here they go. Episode after episode, they are tried. Now, what does the trying do? It doesn't show God what they're made of because he already knew. And he still called them. That's amazing. So the next time you fail, pick yourself up off the ground. This is no pat, Pollyannish kind of answer. Pick yourself up off the ground. God saved you knowing how you'd mess up. Amen? I need, I need to say that first and foremost. He didn't save you hoping you'd do well. He saved you knowing every weakness you have. And that tells us again it's about him, doesn't it? Trials of wondering. The times of Israel's history being referred to in the writer of Hebrews really was a stretch where they had no home. What was the, the trial of wandering from Egypt to Canaan? That simple. How long did that last? Longer than it should have. How do we know that? Well, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you know. They got to the edge. Moses, you know, I, I think God commanded it, but I also think the people wanted to know what's over there. And he makes the mistake of saying, you know, check out the people. Don't ever look at people. Just don't ever look at people. They will let you down every single time. They will intimidate you, disappoint you. Anything imaginable, you'll find looking at people. But they did. The report came back, as you know. No, two of them said, hey. We know there are giants over there. We know there are walled cities. We know their people are strong. But let's go. We can do this. <laughs> but ten of them said, oh, I don't think so. They're bigger than we are. 
They're tougher than we are. We can't do it. And so their negativity, their pessimism, their lack of faith cost them 40 more years in the wilderness. They failed that trial. Now, why were they upset? Why were they, at every turn, why did Israel fail in, a, in one of those trials? Well, one writer put it this way, and it's even alliterated so we can hook it in our minds and think about it. He said the problem was they had no position. They had no power or any sense of political permanence. That's instructive to me. Can I say something? Can I be very bold and upfront with you today? One of the greatest evidences of lack of faith among American Christians is that we are clamoring and upset and striving and fighting and compromising because we want a political permanence. What if God lets things be as bad as they are and seemingly getting worse because he wants us to know what we're made out of? That sounds more like God to me than us just saying, oh, God, make our land great again. And God, you know, answering our prayer in some way that we think he should. What, what does that do? That doesn't increase our faith. But living under, under terms where we are not maybe as free as what we'd like to be to be Christians. Do you think that might maybe serve a spiritual purpose in some way? You got quiet on me. I knew you weren't going to like it. But boy, that lines up with what the Bible says over and over and over again. The reason they compromised over and over and they whined and complained and murmured against God and Moses is they had no political permanence. The reason they asked for a king was because they wanted political clout. I'm not sure that's a biblical objective, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure it is. I never see where Paul said, March on, Christian soldiers. Let's take Rome for God. <laughs> never said that. What it did say, and Simon Peter would say later, is while you're living under an oppressive government, while you're living under persecution, while you're having it hard, rejoice. Because you know God is doing something in your life. And he's changing you, he's making you and molding you into something that you weren't before. And what's going to be on the other side is much better than what is now. I'm not telling you to support sinful things. Of course I'm not doing that. But I'm telling you to go home and go to sleep tonight, even after watching the news and you get mad. Don't lay there and fret. Thank God that you're getting to see what you're made out of. Because your reaction to that is going to show you. There are trials of wondering. And we're experiencing those right now. I think the Bible also speaks of another kind of trial. And that's a, those are trials because of the word. In the book of Luke in chapter 8, we are right in the middle there of the parable of the sower and the seed. And so such an instructive parable that is, Jesus says that, you know what? People coming to Christ, people... And their allegiance to the kingdom is just like a sower who's sowing seed. Maybe you, maybe you went to the bank and took a loan out and bought some grass seed this year. And you put it out. If you get it too far, you know that some of it, most of it hopefully is going to land in your yard. Some of it winds up on the concrete. If you're smart, you blow it back in the grass. But some of it winds up in the mulch where you don't want it. And it can wind up in your rocks maybe where you don't want it. And so this sower is sowing seed to, for a harvest, a, a, a good purpose. And, and at one of those points, Jesus said this, there is some seed that falls on a rock. And they that are on the rock, he said, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. It sprouts. It's, it looks great. It immediately germinates and people stand up and give their testimony. Thank God for saving me. Which is why, you know, I just don't make, I don't make a big deal. Well, I do, but we shouldn't get overly excited when somebody comes down front or somebody comes to an altar. 
you don't have a reason to get excited till about six months later or a year. If you walk in two years later and see them having grown and, and prospered spiritually, then praise God. Because you don't know. And Jesus said some are like that rock. And when they receive the word, it's all joy. It's great. But they have no root. Which for a while believe. You see this word? In a time, and just let's change that word to trial because that's what it is. In a time of trial, they fall away. Now, the interesting thing here is that Luke, like Simon Peter, marries the idea of rejoicing and trials. Right? Simon Peter marries it in a sort of a positive context you who are real Christians have a reason to rejoice in trials Luke using Jesus words marries joy and trials but in a negative relationship and what he does he says at first there's great joy but then comes the trial and they fall away now we we got to have a little more information Matthew tells the parable slightly different. It's not that Luke's wrong. He just gives us more details of what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 13, Matthew records it this way. Yet has he not root in himself, but he endures for a while. For when the tribulation or persecution arises, now look at this, because of the word. By and by, he is offended. Boy, that, that really homes in on the nature of what real persecution is. We're not persecuted because of high gas prices. Or some of you act like you are, right? That's not persecution, is it? No. No. Now, if they issue an edict this week that Christians, all you who are, who are professing Christians have to pay $5 a gallon, everybody else gets to pay 3 that's persecution. I don't see that happening, but, you know, it's not good, it's not economic stuff, unless it's discriminatory, is not persecution. Matthew said Jesus was very specific. The trial or tribulation came because of the word. Let me ask you. Is the conflict in your heart. And what fires you up. And what gets you in trouble. And, and the negativity you feel. Is it because of the word? Or is it just because you don't like the way things are? See I, I don't think a, most American Christians. Are persecuted because of the word. Because we don't stand up for that. We stand up for very vague things. And I'm a patriot, you're a patriot, we're all patriots here. But listen, that's not persecution. Persecution is on account of the word. What do you mean, Pastor? That you believe the only way to heaven is through the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus Christ. You believe that, you will have every fired up, leftist type, angry, progressive, agnostic, atheistic person in the world hating you because the cross as Paul would say is the thing that offends the most why because the cross says number one you're a sinner there's no need for a cross and a man to hang and die on a cross except you are a sinner oh boy you done offended them now and then along with that gospel how it is we're saved he took our place all of that but then comes the moral things, the ways we are to live because we are Christians. Now, if you believe that, you will be persecuted in some way. You'll be countered. You'll be opposed. But real persecution is only because you believe the word. So the next time you get all up in the wind, you need to ask yourself, Am, am I being opposed because I believe the Bible? Or is it for another reason? 
So trials because of the word are a real thing. Number three, there are trials of seeing loved ones suffer. Galatians chapter 4, let me set the context for you here. Galatians chapter 4 is written just after Paul's first missionary journey. First letter of Paul, maybe the first letter of all in the New Testament. That or James, we don't know, but it's close. And so the surprising thing is, is that he's writing back to the churches he had just founded and passed through on his first journey. It would help you at some point to put in your mind these three cities, Iconium, Derbe, and Lystra. You get those implanted in your mind, you will understand the book of Galatians and exactly where Paul was writing back. And I'm sure there were some other churches. And he says to them, the theme of that letter is, he says, I can't believe that you so soon, I haven't been gone just a little while, and you've already distorted the gospel. That's what the book of Galatians is about. But here he's getting personal. And so he writes back to them, and when he visited them, some of them, he just left one of those cities where, remember, they thought he was Mercury, the messenger God, because he did all the talking. They thought Barnabas was Zeus or Jupiter. The actual priest of Zeus came out and said, oh, we're going to offer offerings to you. And Paul tears his clothes and gets all upset, says, what are you doing? We're just men like you are. You can't worship us. And then he preaches the gospel to them. Well, they didn't like that. But then come later these jealous Jews. You ever been persecuted because of jealousy? Jealous Jews. Because they had stole their thunder in the synagogue. Hey, they didn't make the mistake of letting Paul preach, right? <laughs> I know his credentials, but you let him preach, you, you, know, you, mess, you let the bull in the door, you're going to get the horns, right? You let Paul preach in the synagogue, he's preaching Jesus. And most of them don't like it. But he does it every single time. They were so angry they followed him. And incited the Gentile crowd to pick up rocks in a Jewish manner and stone Paul. Now, I've never been stoned, never known anybody who has, but my imagination doesn't have to work overtime to figure out what you look like when you've been hit in the face with a bunch of rocks. Amen, Norman? <laughs> Norman took a little fall the other week and looked pretty bad. And I think Yvonne's nursed him back to health. But, you know, you get hit in the face with a rock after a rock. Now look at what he says. So here's Paul. They think he's dead. Whether he's di he dies or not, I do not know. They think he's dead. He's that hurt. He gets up and he goes to the next church. Most of us wouldn't have the guts to go any further. We'd have went back home. Paul heals the best he can. I think they help him limp into the next city where he witnesses to the next group of people, win some of them to the Lord, and this is what he's talking about. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at first. I think the people he's writing to were listening to a man who had had his face broken up, his arms bruised, his skull shattered. He was... He was stoned to the point of death and he looked like it and he says you know what I looked like when I first preached to you now let me explain the King James here let's take that word temptation out put in trial and my trial which was in my flesh you despise not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus what's he describing he's describing what they went through as they sat there and had to watch him preach the gospel to them with one or both eyes swollen up, having help, being helped in front of them, sitting on whatever was available, limping in and out. He wasn't much to look at. His visage, his injuries were a trial. You see that? That's what he's saying. You had to look at me, and it was a trial to you. That's exactly what he's saying. But you listened and you received the truth. You know, one of the worst trials you and I will ever suffer, ever suffer, is watching loved ones wither and die. This past couple of years has produced some of the worst suffering I've ever seen. 
have to tell you I have no respect for anybody who thinks this is nothing. You're not in the real world. Catch up. People are dying. They're suffering a horrible death. And I have watched their loved ones struggle powerless at times because of the whole situation. And there's not, what's the answer? Well, the only real answer is Jesus coming back because there is no perfect answer to any of those situations. It is a trial to watch that. Same thing. You know, we're not having our families around, but nothing in the world interrupts life like the reminder that we're all going to die. That's a trial to us. Watching a loved one suffer, watching a loved one die, watching a loved one go through treatment after treatment, any course of action you can describe is a trial, and it's because we live in a sinful world. That parent, that loved one, that brother, sister, that child, you know knows the Lord. Why do they have to go through this? There are no answers. Anybody who can give you an answer to that is just making something up. I think the Bible knows. The Bible says that's a trial. Don't let it pass without growing. And finally, and, and I say that because I know many of you have seen and experienced that same thing this past couple of years. And back to five years, almost all of us in some way or another have experienced that. Then finally, there's a, a final kind of trial, I think, falls in this category. It's found in Matthew chapter 26 and other gospel presentations. But it's the trial of facing the evil one. Now, the mistake we make is we place every trial in this category. You know, people walk in church, I tell you what, that old devil's been after me this morning. I woke up mad. Well, now hang on a second. Did you wake up mad or did the devil wake up mad? Or did the devil make you mad? How did he make you mad? You mean, well, no, wait a minute. I don't think that's the devil. I think that's you. That's who you're talking about. It's you. Yeah. But, so we blame the devil for everything. You know where I stand on that. And, boy, he's, a, he's an evil being, but he sure gets a bad rap for everything. <laughs> Somebody's take up for him, right? No. But you know what I'm saying. But there are times. There are times, and we need to be discerning and understand when those times are, when the trial is caused by the evil one. Now, the devil's, he's a finite being. You can't be everywhere at once. So if you say the devil's after you and I say the devil's after me, one of us ain't got it right. Because he, he, he can't be everywhere. He's not like God. But he sends his emissaries. Is there such a thing as spiritual warfare involving demons? Yes. Is every trial we face that? No. But there's one place where we know it was. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 and 41, and, and he came to his disciples and he finds them asleep. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is fighting a battle. With the evil one to the point that, that his sweat becomes as blood dripping off of his face. That's warfare, ladies and gentlemen. And he comes to his disciples and they're not in the warfare. They're sleeping. And what he's saying to them is an indictment. You have no idea what I'm going through. Why don't you help me pray through this? Which is why when we see somebody going through a true spiritual warfare, we need to pray for them. In that way. Not just in some bland, you know, nighttime statement. But honest to goodness going to battle for somebody else. When you discern and you know they are in the midst of a spiritual warfare. Jesus was. And he comes to his disciples and he finds them asleep and he says unto Peter. And I wonder if Peter thought about this when he wrote this first letter. Yep, I knew what it was to be in a trial. I, I went to sleep. It doesn't tell him that, but I imagine he remembered it. And Jesus said, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into trial, temptation. In other words, Satan was working on Jesus, right? He wasn't working on the disciples. He'd already sifted Peter as wheat, right? Made him look bad, made him you know, 
led him, tempted him to fall. But now Satan's attention is on the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one he knows to be the second person of the Godhead, not knowing exactly what's about to happen, but he's working on him. And Jesus is fighting trial, temptation. He says to his disciples, you need to be ready, praying, prepare yourself so you won't be set upon by this kind of demonic activity. Now, I th think also that Simon Peter knew exactly what he was talking about. Because if you flip over to chapter 5, and I actually have it, I think, next slide, Grady, so they can read it there. You look in verses 8 and 9, he's going to say something. He's going to say exactly, I never had seen this before, but he's saying exactly to them what Jesus said to him. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. With that in mind, look at this, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. These believers, along with every other kind of trial, were going to be attacked by the evil how does he attack us? Oh, I don't have time to explain that. We could talk about it forever. But through families, through people, through circumstances, through any means at his disposal, the attacks of the evil one come upon us. So it becomes clear to me, I don't know about you, but he's not talking about circumstances that are peculiar to just a few Christians. He's talking to circumstances and trials that happen to us all. Every one of these categories of trials, which I think are broad categories and cover almost every category in the Bible, we are all subject to them. What's Peter's advice going to be? It's going to be to watch, to pray, to trust, to have faith. But then leave today with this word, rejoice. That trial means God hasn't forgotten you. God knows who you are, where you are, and he, you mean an awful lot to him. So much that he's allowed this through his fingers into your life. So that on the other side, you'll be more like him than you were before. To be continued, rejoicing in trials. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed, just a second. And maybe Kelly could come and play just one verse. I'll give you an opportunity wherever you are whatever the need of your heart is. Maybe you are right in the middle of something right now. You have no idea how to contemplate it, understand it, how to cipher it out. Maybe the Holy Spirit has said to you through his word this morning, this is of God. God's letting this happen. Now what are you going to do in response to that? Fathers, take your word, speak to our hearts this morning, encourage us. We don't want to be like those children of Israel who had to wonder 40 more years because they didn't believe you, they didn't trust you. God, whatever situation we are in right now, whether it is a trial of wondering or a trial of Satan, a trial of watching loved ones sick and hurting, God, give us the faith we need to trust you so that on the other side we'll be stronger, more like you, more capable of representing you to a lost and dying world. Jesus' name. Nobody looks, she begins to play. I invite you to come.
thank you for coming this morning, church. Let me personally thank you for last week, every offer of encouragement and the, your gift as a church and the sub sandwiches and the cookies and uh, every encouraging word. Some of our youth wrote, wrote cards and I read them again this morning. What a blessing that was. Thank you to every single one of you who encouraged us and our family in this. Thank you so much for that. We love you so much. We got another special service plan. I'll give you the date exactly. Is it before Thanksgiving or the one after, Doug? What do we decide? <laughs> Doug dropped a bomb. I'm going to blame it on Doug. Uh, either Sunday before or after Thanksgiving, we're going to, have a, we're going to try to do Thanksgiving meal and um, have our special um, testimony service, all right? I'm not sure how we're going to do the microphones because I don't want y'all swallowing the microphone and somebody else standing it, do it, that kind of thing. We'll figure something out, but we're looking forward to that. So keep, that, keep those two dates open. Until we tell you which one it is. We'll tell you next week, okay? And uh, we look forward to that. Buck, it's good to see you back, brother. I hope you're doing well. I'm glad to see you. Do you feel like dismissing us in prayer this morning? Would you pray for us?